warehouses, railways, canals. The infrastructure of the Industrial Revolution that made the northwest of England the engine of empire. And that's a good story, but it's one that's often told. This film is about the cultural riches of empire, ancient art, exhibits which filled our new museums, influences which shaped our architecture. It fueled a hunger for the exotic which transformed our taste and our towns. We explore the cost of empire, exploitation, slavery, a clash of cultures which has generated stunning new works of art and go behind the scenes to find treasures rarely seen by the public, brought home by travellers eager to share marvels from far-flung territories overseas. The red of empire coloured, at various times, some 80 countries around the globe, new territories to do business, new destinations to visit, and bring back what you could find. Viewed from rainy Britain, the empire on which the sun never set and its treasures seemed exotic and alluring. Brits were seized with collection mania on a scale which takes the breath away. Manchester Museum has four and a half million natural history exhibits. That's before you get to the pottery and fossils and mummies. Now, most of those are never on display, but each one has its own individual story to tell. The museum's part of Manchester University, so much of its collection is used for research. Henry McGee is head of collections. So most of the objects and specimens that you see on display are from the late 19th century and the early 20th century right. because that was the heyday of collecting. Right, uh, because I guess empire, tourism, exactly. booming, yeah. Exactly. Natural history was hugely popular in Britain and people took that interest with them when right. they went overseas. Not collected by experts then, not scientists and explorers? No, not at all really. All kind of travellers, soldiers, missionaries, business people. Right. Ready and waiting for whatever was brought home, Britain's new municipal museums, set up partly to combat the prevailing vice of intoxication among the labouring classes, i.e. to keep people out of the pubs. OK, so just show you a drawer of butterflies. Oh, yeah. And we can already see in this cabinet there are hundreds, possibly thousands, mm. of, of, it, of butterflies. And in this room where we are, there are two and a half million insects. Just in this room? It, yeah. There are vast storerooms behind the scenes. Each plant, each creature, made an individual journey to get here. This plover, shot by a hunter, was about to be sold as food in Egypt in 1864, but a traveller saved it from the pot. The place he saw it was in the market, because in the days before factory farming, people ate what they shot. Its throat had been cut because it was sold to be halal. Ah. He knew the bird was unusual, and sent it to Henry Dresser, author of a renowned Victorian bird book. And this specimen is exactly the same bird that the artist had in, in front of him when he produced this picture. Amazing. It's a fantastic combination of science and art. All this was happening in something called the Evangelical Revival. The Victorians hated to do anything just for pure enjoyment's right. sake. It needed to be uplifting. There was an idea called um, a serious leisure, where you tried to, to do things which were good for your character. Yeah. So shooting birds, collecting plants or whatever, that could be seen as studying God's work if you were religious. So they wouldn't just be doing it, as we'd say, for fun? Uh, no. They had an awareness that they could make a serious contribution to knowledge. Yeah. And so that was what their fulfilment was. But you definitely get the feeling there was also a bit of showing off when these donations were made. Sophie Everest has made a study of wealthy hunters who spent many months a year pursuing big game. Men like Lord Edgerton of Tatton Park in Cheshire. So of the 600 or so animals that Edgerton shot, around 40 have ended up here at the Manchester Museum. The rest still line the walls of the Tenants Hall at Tatton Park. These men could afford the huge expense of foreign travel and the safari, 
They competed with each other about the size and rarity of kills that they brought back from Africa and India and elsewhere. Um, but they also wanted to be recognized as contributors to our scientific understanding of the natural world by donating kills as mounted taxidermy specimens to museums. And the kills had to be prepared with artistry. They had to look beautiful and realistic. Edgerton turned to a man who'd originally wanted to be a sculptor. Edgerton's preferred taxidermist was the workshop of Roland Ward Limited, and Ward was celebrated for his artistic attention to detail and accurate modelling. So taxidermy was elevated to an art form. At that time, people viewed animals differently. Zoo creatures were interbred to create curiosities. Maud, who died in the final year of Empire, 1949, is one of the last. A tigon, or tiger lion cross, from Manchester's Bellevue Zoo. Her skin waited 66 years for a taxidermist with skills akin to the Victorians. Phil Leggett from Bolton. Taxidermy is a, a combination of art, science and craft, because it requires all three to produce a really good result. We don't know exactly how long the skin was stored for, uh, or by whom, but during that time, the skin deteriorated. We had absolutely nothing to work on. We didn't even have a skull, we had no bones. We had, all we had was the one very poor conditioned skin to work with. The starting point was a photo of Maud during life. The skin was then crafted over a mannequin to create the museum's exhibit. She didn't actually have any whiskers at all, so those whiskers are actually made from birds' feathers. So we had to do quite a lot of little repair jobs, and it was just a, the whole thing was just a, a remodel and a repair job, really. It wasn't just animals that were donated, it was everything, including portraits put on mummies so you could tell who was inside. Dr. Campbell Price is curator of Egypt and Sudan. These are the Manchester Museum's world-class Fayoum portraits. We had a cotton merchant called Jesse Howarth here, and he put a lot of money into archaeology in Egypt, and as a return, he got the, these portraits uh, for his own collection, and he donated them to the museum. So empire is what brings the, these things to Manchester? Yeah. This is uh, really sort of freaking me out a bit, because these are so not like mummies as we conceptualise them. That young man there, you know, that young woman. Yeah. They're strongly influenced by Rome, the right. uh, tradition of portrait painting in Rome. These are 2,000 years old, these they portraits. Are, yeah. The Baya tapestry is 1,000 years old. Yeah. And these look far, far more advanced artistically. When they were first discovered, I think people were surprised because they assumed this type of portraiture, you know, began in the Renaissance. So this, <laughs> over a thousand years earlier, there are these incredible portraits. Now, it turns out not only humans were made into mummies. Okay. So where are we going now, Campbell? So we're going into the organic store. I'll let you go first. Okay. Oh, <laughs> mummies. <laughs> yes, so this is, uh, this is the collection of 20 uh, human mummies. And if you come upstairs, we've got something else. So here we have our animal mummies. Oh, God. <laughs> wow. So uh, these are what? mummified cats. Uh, this is a nice example of a mummified cat. That's a cat? That's a mummified cat with his little face and his little ear. He's oh, about... God. Two and a half thousand years old. There were tens of millions wow. of these animal mummies. But why were they mummifying all these cats in, in the first place? Well, because these were gifts for the gods. You might pray to the cat goddess, the crocodile god, and so you'd get a mummified member of their species and leave it <laughs> at the temple. Oh my god. There was one animal mummy catacomb in Middle Egypt that was emptied, and 180,000 cat mummies were shipped uh, to Liverpool uh, for sale as fertiliser for the fields. Wow. Empire created a global playground for the wealthy, but the rest of society right across the classes decided they wanted a slice too. And that transformed the fortunes of one town in particular. The pleasure palaces of Blackpool have seen their ups and downs. They owe their existence, though, 
to the desire by Lancashire's textile workers who were driving the economic engine of empire to get a slice of that imperial pomp and opulence for themselves. And that led to a kind of entertainment arms race here beside the seaside. The tower attractions versus the winter gardens. It offered a spectacular escape from day-to-day -day life in a mill town with fabulous architecture and decor influenced by the foreign and exotic. It plugged into the zeitgeist and proved a ruthlessly efficient way of parting visitors from their money. Hi, Carl. Hi, Stuart. Welcome I've come to meet Carl Carrington, Blackpool's heritage manager. Tell me about this struggle that was going on in Blackpool. Well, of course, the Golden Mile wasn't called the Golden Mile because of the beach. It was because of the sheer amount of money you could make here. So, basically, these two companies were constantly vying right. to get bigger numbers of visitors, make more money, both big For private companies. Market. Yeah. Indeed. The Winter Gardens opened in 1878. The rival tower complex opened in 1894. And both sides added attractions in a tit-for-tat war lasting decades. And during Wakes Week's holidays, visitors by the tens of thousands were lured in by a promise of the exotic. There's a huge market of working class people. Indeed, and of course those working class people were working in, in Lancashire mills, weaving cotton. Countries like India were exporting their raw material yeah. to Lancashire. We were weaving it and selling it back to Empire. This is where the money was coming from, and it enabled all of those working class households to have holidays in places like Blackpool. And what was it, Carl, these people were coming to see and do? Well, let me take you on a whistle-stop tour. Great. First stop sounds promising, the Indian Lounge. But this feels like a modern nightclub, Carl. Well, this isn't what it used to look like. It was an incredible celebration of yeah. everything Indian. It looked like the throne room of an Indian Maharaja, incredibly elaborate. But, of course, it, that was actually part of the appetite of tourists at the time. Yeah. They wanted the exotic, they wanted the different. It looks amazing, so why, why rip it out? What happened? Well, that was part of a move towards offering a more contemporary sort of feel to the complex. Mm. There was much more of a sense of wanting to look forward after the war rather than back to history as part of the town's yeah. entertainment. The wealthy weren't only heading to the colonies. European travel was all the rage. This is an amazing room. <laughs> and Spanish, by the looks of things, yeah? Yes, this is the Spanish Hall. Those people that were making money from Empire that were actually visiting places like Spain and Italy on holiday, and, you know, their workers wanted a piece of that. God, this is an enormous place, never-ending spaces. Yep, and here we are in the Empress Ballroom, which is the biggest of our spaces. And the Empress that it's named after is Victoria. Yes, of course, Empress of India, Empress of the rest of the Empire as well. The ballroom and the whole Winter Gardens has been bought by the council, who were spending £54 million doing it up. When it opened in 1896, two years after the tower, it was at the heart of the battle for visitors. When the tower was built, they then built this. It was directly to, to offset the fact that they had a ballroom and this building didn't. So, of course, what then happened is the tower refurbished again in a much more elaborate style. So you, that's the way the competition sort of went back and fro Before. over the years. Make no mistake, the tower meant business. Two and a half thousand tonnes of iron, steel and bravado, an unmistakable landmark and immediate hit with Victorian visitors. Time to get the inside track on its unique lineup of attractions. So here we are in Blackpool Tower, yeah. which of course is a great rival of the Winter Gardens. You've got yeah. these incredible panels of exotic birds. Those lovely tiles, yeah. Which refer really to the free fire aviary which was on the roof, in the rooftop really? gardens. Really? And of course they had a menagerie as well. Tucked behind the scenes, awaiting restoration, other touches of the foreign and exotic. Are you ready for this? I think so. This is the big one. Oh, my. Well, this is spectacular. Welcome to Blackpool Tower Ballroom. The tower sees itself as the spiritual home of ballroom dancing. Visitors still come almost daily for afternoon tea and a glide across the huge dance floor. It's amazing. 
it's absolutely amazing. And one of the interesting things is that, you know, this features on the Strictly final every year, but yeah. you don't really see the ballroom. There's a big set in here. So yeah. you're not actually you seeing see this incredible this, space. Which is a shame. It's amazing. But it's not India or Africa or Tigers or Empire like that. It's more European here. Yes, this is, this is modelled on the Opera Garnier in Paris, so it's an extension of that desire to have a little bit of that life that the rich had, working class people being able to enjoy that. Sorry. But you did mention tigers, so if you'd like to follow me... Great. Ah, no, this is amazing. Yep, welcome to Blackpool Tower Circus. So you are now right at the heart of the tower. Yeah, underneath it directly, here's the... Four legs and there's the base of the tower, amazing. Yeah. The circus has run every season since 1894. This is so ornate, so decorative and, and exotic, the decoration, isn't it? Indeed. Very much North African, but with all those sort of connotations of empire yeah. and the East. Almost like the epitome of what the late 19th century person would think of as exotic. Yeah, absolutely. Speaking of which, you mentioned tigers. Right. If you'd like to follow me, I'll show you where they lived. Down in the bowels, beneath the circus, a labyrinth. Right, it is in here somewhere, but it's, um, it's a bit of a maze down here. I'm beginning to worry Carl has no more clue than I do. Now, hang on, that's a cage. Now, this is a cage. I, we, I can't tell you what, was, what animals were kept in there. Well, there's these, something big, because that's a big cage with a chain on the door. I don't know. So, Who knows? They could be hop hippopotamus. It wasn't guinea pigs, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> here we go. This is it. Oh, that's a... What is that? Finally, we're here. A cage with a handle pull and a tunnel to the ring. The animals would have been behind here, and then when they were ready for them, they'd lift that up and they'd know to come out. But the tigers are gone. Animal acts thought exotic in days of empire are a thing of the past. If Blackpool was about empire-themed tourism, other cities were flush with money and rapidly expanding thanks to empire's global commerce. One city defined itself through overseas trade and culture. Liverpool, gateway of empire, made a fortune. And look how it spent it. Either side of the library, the World Museum and the Walker Art Gallery, all speaking of Liverpudlian civic pride. The Walker, home to some of Europe's finest sculpture, painting and decorative arts, and woven into the collection that pride in empire. Pauline Rushton is a curator here. Thanks for agreeing to show me around. You're welcome. If ever a creature uh, says the far flung and the exotic, it's a peacock. That's right, yes. This fabulous piece was made by Minton's in 1873, and it's one of only 12 that were made, in fact. Okay. So it's a very rare thing. Before coming to the gallery, it stood in the town hall. It's obviously something that was acquired by the city as a kind of status symbol. It would be an exhibition piece, yeah. is how it would be made. That's saying to me, someone wanting to do a bit of bigging up of the great imperial city of Liverpool, quite, really, isn't it? Quite possibly, yes. It would have been expensive at the time, so it really um, would have been an impressive thing for the citizens of Liverpool to yeah. see on display in the town hall. Amazingly, it was cast at the factory in Stoke as a single piece. No fiddly bits stuck on afterwards. How exotic would a peacock have been to Liverpool back then? Well, for many years, throughout the 19th century and well into the 20th century, in fact, sailors, of course, were bringing back exotic animals right. through the port. My own family had a parrot, and we also had a couple of monkeys as well, little marmosets, which obviously wouldn't be the tough thing today, but back in the 1920s or 30s, yeah. that would be quite a common thing for Liverpool families to have. People did bring back what they thought were small monkeys that grew into much bigger monkeys or gorillas even. And there are accounts of the, the animals basically tearing their houses apart. Liverpool wasn't just a port for other people's goods. It was also cashing in through manufacturing, you might think, in a cynical way. Behind the scenes, this pottery, made here in vast quantities, 
and targeted at Americans who just escaped empire and declared independence. The interesting thing on this bowl in particular is this great image here on the back of George Washington standing on top of the British lion which lies prone. And defeated, And yeah. defeated. So only a few years after the revolution had finished, wow. 1783, yeah. were selling back to the colonists the idea of their their victory their revolution, over us. Their victory over us. Some yeah. people would have thought this was almost treasonous. They would, um, if you look at it from our point of view. But back in those days, what they're looking at is the commercial benefits. But that commercial drive and empire had a darker side of clashing cultures and slavery. And that's inspired a new and spectacular temporary exhibition in the Walker. Slaves of Fashion is the creation of two Liverpool-based artists, the Singh twins, Amrit and Rabindra. Their artwork is inspired by artefacts from Liverpool's seven galleries and museums. This room, this exhibition space with your work in it, I mean, it's amazing. The pieces look beautiful, visually it's very arresting. But it's details now, aren't there? Individual details in each work, in each piece that Tell us a little more about that story of, of, of exploitation and empire. That's right, yes. Yeah. So this is the figure of uh, the pirate Calico Jack. So he represents the darker side of empire and colonialism right. built on conflict and, and conquest and also industrial espionage, if you like, as well. OK. The real-life Calico Jack was an 18th century English pirate captain, a symbol of British sharp practice. The British gifted some horses to uh, the king of the northern region of India simply because they wanted to see how he would navigate them into the heart of his kingdom and they would follow and thereby con conquer that area. So it was, a, it was a trick, it was a ruse It was a trick, too. yes, it was indeed, yes. There's also a drowning goat, the tale of a man who wanted to grab the Kashmir shawl industry for Britain. In order to do that, they needed the Kashmiri goats. So he piled the females onto one ship, the males onto another ship, and tried to smuggle them out, out of India. But unfortunately, um, a storm brewed, right. and one of the ships sank, and his, his plan was completely foiled. Of course. <laughs> you should have mixed them up, <laughs> shouldn't you? <laughs> <they? Yeah. laughs> this piece is called Chintz, and that one's got some interesting connotations, doesn't it? It has, because it's actually a, a patterned uh, floral design that people associate as being quintessentially English, when in actual fact the design goes back to these brightly coloured, hand-painted and printed fabrics of India. Yeah. And the key figure here is wearing examples of the original Indian chintz in that beautiful red and blue waistcoat that she has on. But as you move down the figure, there's all sorts of different types of fabric from different time periods, which represent how the chintz design influenced British arts and design across the board. So, for example, you have a Liberty scarf in one hand yeah. and you have a swatch of cloth, which is by uh, Laura Ashley. So you're going from the original chintz to what we call chintzy. Yes. <laughs> this is all about that luxury lifestyle that was yeah. sustained by slavery uh, yeah. during the periods of empire and colonialism. You have on the table you know, tea, chocolate, sugar, even opium. Oh, really? <laughs> A luxury in its day, yes. Yeah. Uh, juxtaposed against that, you also have these shackles interwoven into the design of the carpet too. Wow. In this piece, cotton, who is this central figure? This is the Indian princess, uh, Sophia Dilip Singh, and she represents some of the legacies of empire, which was displacement and dispossession, okay. in that her father's kingdom um, of northern India was annexed to the British Empire in the middle of the 1800s, and as a result, he came to Britain, exiled here, and she was born here. So the beginnings of the British Asian community at that time. She's one of the first British Asians. I would say so, yes, British-born. Right. And her badge says votes for women. That's right, she was a prominent suffragette, um, and uh, she campaigned against women having to pay taxes without the vote. And she's wearing this beautiful jewellery, which represents the fact that she refused to pay the fine for that, and her jewellery was confiscated <laughs> by the bailiffs. And although this is a story of, of loss and displacement and dispossession, um, we've gained, some of us have gained some good things from it. Uh, this gentleman up here. Yes, lots of good things, I would say. This is Dean Muhammad. He was an employee of the East India Company that traded with, with Britain in the very early days. And he introduced um, shampoo and curry to the English uh, nation. And nation yes. Well, there's two things <laughs> we couldn't do without, so thanks, <laughs> Dean. <laughs> Two centuries after slavery, many of us, especially in inner cities, can trace historical links back to that time. 
The economic impact and its associated problems are still being felt today. And that's led to an artwork with an extraordinary story, the bust of a woman who's helped one community in Manchester's Moss Side turn a corner. The road sign now says Westerling Way, but back in the 80s and 90s when this was Gooch Close in the heart of Manchester's Moss Side, I'm not sure I'd have strolled along it quite so nonchalantly because back then Gooch Close was a byword for guns, crime and violence. Three similar shootings, all within a mile of each other, in just four days. Community leaders are still hopeful solutions can be found to bring an end to the shootings. And anti-violence campaigner Irin Mabel has her offices right in the middle of it. This is your office then in what would once have been one of the scariest addresses in Britain, would you say? Yes, I probably would say that, yes. What was it like then? Well, because unfortunately there were one or two families that were, you know, or their young people were involved in gun and gang crime. As an ordinary family living on the street, just wanting to live an ordinary life, sometimes you may have felt that you may get caught up in crossfire, so it wasn't a nice place to be. Nearby, a one-time pub, former headquarters of the Pepper Hill mob, chief rivals to the Gooch Close gang in a drugs war. It's now a mosque. Crime is associated with deprivation. Both those things, do you think they're partly a legacy of slavery and empire? Yes, most definitely I do. Um, but it's a different type of slavery. Whilst people are not in the shackles, there's still that mental slavery. People in their minds are still in bondage, thinking that they cannot aspire to things yeah. and they have to remain the lower of the lower class. Working with police, council and other community groups, Irinma's charity brought people together and helped cut gun crime by 92%. And that's the achievement marked by the artwork which was put on display in the town hall. It's the creation of sculptor Karen Lyons. We wanted to commemorate Irinma's achievements, so we thought we'd do a portrait statue of her and make it from recycled guns that have been, been obtained from the Greater Manchester Police. This is made of actual guns? Yes. In this sculpture, there are 50 long barrel firearms. That had shot people? No, no. They, uh, we're not allowed to have those. The police keep those for right. forensic evidence, but these are ones that have been obtained by either amnesty or capture. Every other bust alongside it portrays a dead white man. And what's just as incredible is it's the first statue of a woman unveiled in Manchester Town Hall. How does that feel, Irina? It's so surreal. For me, it creates a new paradigm in history. Yeah. And, the, and I think the most important thing is not only I'm a woman, I'm a black woman, but I think more importantly, I'm still alive. Yeah. <laughs> The northwest of England's links to the business of empire ran deep, and that's one reason its museums and galleries are such a storehouse of wonders and exotica from around the globe. Britain changed the world under empire, but the world also changed Britain, an uneasy process at times in both directions. But the cultural enrichment of empire is woven deep into the fabric of our lives, and even as we reflect upon the cost, it's part of who we are. Thank you.